Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to the Edge Church. My name is Ryan Van Camp, and I'm the production director here. The Edge Church is a body of believers based out of Aurora, Illinois, but we're currently following a house church model with uh, different houses hosting our services throughout the Fox Valley. So whether you are located in Aurora, Oswego, Geneva, or the surrounding communities, we have a house church nearby for you. Before we get started with today's service and continue on with our sermon series, Vintage Faith, we want to make sure that you're aware of a couple things going on in the life of our church. If you've been here for a little while um, and you've been checking out the Edge Church and you're saying, I want to know more about this community and I'm considering joining and becoming a member of the Edge Church, we have a great opportunity coming up for you led by our elders on October 9th. We'll be having a membership informational meeting. So come meet with our pastors, meet with a couple of our elders to learn more about this body of believers and how we do our faith journeys together. Speaking of our elders, we would also ask you over the next week really to hold our elders and pastors and leadership uh, just up in prayer as they're going to be taking a couple days over the next week uh, to really seek after what God has next for our church community, uh, both the big picture and uh, the day-to-day -day details. So really over the next week, if you would keep our pastors and elders along with their families just hold them up in prayer so they can uh, really seek after what God has for us next. But now let's get ready to engage in a time of worship as we prepare to hear the next mes message in our series, Vintage Faith. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Good to be together again. Um, excited for just another opportunity for us to worship the Lord and, um, I was just thinking about in the Psalms where David writes to us and says, I lift up my eyes to the hills and where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And I was just thinking about how worship is such an awesome opportunity for us to, to kind of fix our eyes, get our eyes off ourselves and all the other stuff that that so often just tends to distract us and plague us and works against us in a lot of ways, but helps us just to set our eyes on the Lord and be reminded of who he is. And in Philippians 2, it tells us that, that God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And I feel like as we come to worship today, that's what we're coming to do. We're coming to exalt the name of Jesus, to have our eyes and our hearts set on him. And I just believe that as we lift him up, that, that the Lord just draws us near to him. And, and we're reminded that, that God is bigger than what we're going through, that God's more powerful, that he's able, that he's able to deal with what, whatever we're, we find ourselves in today. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you just to sing and just to lift up your voice, lift up your, your heart, lift up your song to the Lord in worship. And let's just, let's just see how the God wants to move in our midst as we glorify him. Just sing this with me. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Lord Jesus, you reign above it all. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over the universe. Over every heart, there is no higher name. Oh, Jesus, you reign above it all. Yeah, Jesus, you reign. Come on, sing. Search the world, oh, but it 
over the universe and over every heart there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave I seated alone in glory Throned on the highest praise Oh yeah, you sent the darkness running Out of an empty grave I seated alone in glory Throned on the highest praise Oh yeah, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, throned on the highest praise. And you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, throned on the highest praise. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every heart, and there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all, you reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe. Over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and in earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting world. There is no higher name. Oh, Jesus, you reign. Above it all, reign above it all, reign above it all. Yeah, I above, I above, reign above it all.
We just confess, God, that we need you today. God, we need you to move. God, we need you to speak. Jesus. God, we want to hear you. God, we want to know you. The Lord, come and speak to us. Come and minister in our hearts, God. Come and lead us this morning, Lord. God, just awaken hearts to you today, to your presence, to your goodness, to your love, kindness, your faithfulness. God, help us to receive your word today. No one like you, God. No one like you. Worthy, God worthy of all of our praise. Yeah. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, God.
Good morning. Welcome to The Edge. My name is Brandy, and I'm so glad you've joined us today as we continue our series called Vintage Faith. Listen, whether you've been around this community for a long time or if you're just tuning in for the very first time, we are so glad that you're here and invite you wherever you are on your faith journey to explore your faith here. And today we are going to be specifically looking at how faith expresses itself through obedience. But it's important to remember throughout this entire series that that word faith in its original Greek form, uh, pistos, really means something so much weightier than what we probably normally would think of when we use the word faith. It means a deep inner persuasion or a belief that actually motivates our actions. Faith moves. Faith activates. And so when God invites his children to place their faith in him, he's not merely just suggesting ideas in our minds to believe, but he's suggesting living a life that actually follows him. In other words, our faith should be observable and experienced. But what is our faith in? Well, as Christians, we are believing in the unchanging, trustworthy, reliable word of God. And the longer we follow him, the more we begin to realize that obedience isn't something that we have to do or should do, but it's something that we get to do. Because obedience coupled with faith is really the on-ramp to your great adventure with God. And today, we'll be looking at the Bible character Noah, who probably experienced this more than anyone else we could even think of. Most of you likely remember the famous story of Noah and the ark. Uh, even if you didn't grow up hearing Bible stories very much, you're probably somewhat familiar with this story. It's definitely a standout, uh, maybe because it's so visually stimulating and honestly just unbelievable. Here we have God who sees that the entire human race has turned totally evil, except he finds favor with this one man, Noah. So he instructs Noah to build this large boat called an ark, big enough for Noah and his family and two of every living creature to preserve them when this flood comes upon the earth and destroys all of humanity. The flood takes 40 days where the earth is submerged in water. And when the water finally recedes, Noah, his family, and all these living animals get to sort of emerge from this ark and have a do-over. They get to repopulate the earth God's way. And then we even have this story tied up with a bow, a rainbow in the sky that to this day, we get to look at and remember God's faithfulness and his promise never to flood the earth again. It's a wild and memorable story, but it's more than that. It's rich in symbolism and foreshadowing as far as the gospel, baptism, new birth, and even Jesus' return goes. But today, our focus is really going to be more on Noah and his walk in obedience and faith. Because we're just normal, average, ordinary people, right? Living our life, trying to walk this faith out. And it's important to remember that that's what Noah was too. He was an average, ordinary man who put his faith in an extraordinary God and experienced miracles because of it. The text that we'll be looking at today is Hebrews eleven seven, And it says, by faith. And I just want to pause right there for a minute because everything else that we hear about today, we cannot forget that everything Noah did, this was by faith. It does not say by expertise or strategy or experience or strength or status or manipulation. It says by faith. Noah, being warned by God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to save his family. By his faith, there it is again, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with the faith. <laughs> it's, it's one thing to start with faith, isn't it? <laughs> and it's a whole other thing to keep it. 
But just look at what it says his reward was. His reward was becoming an heir of righteousness. Or I kind of like the way the message version puts it. It says the result was intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. Isn't that really kind of our, our chief goal? Our real desire here as we walk through this earth that we would know what it is to walk with and be intimate with God. I mean, really, above desiring any circumstantial changes or accomplishments or events, to really know and be known by God. You know, King David wrote about this in the psalm. He said, one thing I ask from the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon his beauty and seek him in his temple. You know, that wasn't just a flowery sentiment or a poetic notion that David wrote that. David was called by God, the man after his own heart, because he would do everything that God wanted him to do. See, faith requires action, doing. In fact, it's your actions that really prove your faith. Uh, James puts it this way, faith by itself if not accompanied by actions, is actually dead. And we know this. I mean, we practice this without even thinking about it. Think about it. We, we put faith in a pilot. How do we know? Well, because we board the plane, right? We put faith in a chef. Well, how do we know? Well, because we ate the food. So we must have had faith in him, right? We have faith in the coach by executing the play, and when we place our active faith in God, our spiritual muscles not only get exercised, but strengthened. And then it becomes easier to do it again because you're experiencing God as trustworthy. Remember, Noah was considered an heir of righteousness as a byproduct of keeping with the faith. We have to understand, this wasn't just a, a one-time decision. It wasn't like God had this talk with Noah, Noah said yes, and then it was done. This was a process. And may I say, it was a lengthy process. When I went back and read this familiar story, but through Noah's eyes, one thing really stuck out to me, and that is just how much waiting <laughs> is in this story. Oh my goodness, there is a lot of waiting. I mean, he had to wait for it to rain. And then when it started raining, he had to wait a long time for it to stop. And then he had to wait for the floods to recede and then wait for the earth to dry and then wait to repopulate the earth. I mean, so much waiting. We know that Noah built an ark and then there was a flood and then it all, the rainbow. But do we really understand just how much waiting is a part of Noah's story? From the time God told Noah to build the ark, it was, get this, 120 years before the first drop of rain. <laughs> 120 years. That is approximately 43,800 days of building a boat with no sign of rain. That's 43,800 days of driving one more nail into one more plank of wood with no drizzle, no sprinkle, <laughs> and then 400 or 40 days of rain. You ever think about that? Like, why did it take 40 days of flooding? I mean, surely it didn't take that long to wipe everything out. Why that wait in that ark? And even when it stopped raining, it was seven days to take the water to recede. I mean, God could do what he wanted. He could have pulled a drain in the bottom of the earth and he could have just like, you know, drained the earth instantly. But seven days for it to drain. Why all this waiting? Is God slow? Like, did he forget? <laughs> like, but you know, the Bible says that God is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It also says that it's those who will wait on the Lord who will renew their strength. So, 
What if the waiting isn't senseless? What if God had great purpose marked out for Noah and all those around him in the waiting that would only be experienced through this long obedience? If we really believed that, wouldn't it be easier to keep with the faith when nothing else seems to be happening in the natural? You know, in the New Testament, Noah is actually referred to as a preacher of righteousness. And while I'm sure he had some wonderful things to say, it was really his life that was going to preach the loudest now. Just think about the sound of that hammer driving in one more nail over and over again. Have you ever lived like near a construction site and it's like, oh my gosh, it's so annoying. And that noise just like carries, right? Just imagine this over and over and over again. One more nail, one more hammer, one more plank. Of, and every time, just imagine that sound reverberating into the air. And I picture it must have been like incense rising because think about how that must have sounded in the heavenlies. It must have sounded like a song to the ears of the Lord. Because every time he pounded another nail, it was another action that showed, yes, Lord, I believe. When nothing seems to be happening, I still believe. When all circumstances would tell otherwise, it's another day. It's a tired but here for it. It's an I'm fatigued. It's a this is mundane. It's a where are you, Lord? But I'm still placing my trust in you. And all of this must have seemed crazy to everyone else, but he was doing it day in and day out for 120 years. Why? For one reason, because God told him to. God told him to. And every single time that he happened to place another wood on top of another or chop another piece of wood down off of a tree, though he was feeling fatigued, surely physically, he had to know that God was strengthening his spiritual muscles to prepare him for what would be one of the biggest historical events to ever take place. Because whatever is done unto the Lord is never wasted. And we have to remember that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And not just that, but we have to know that he rewards those who seek him. And just think about all of the other people who lived near or around Noah. Just think about how that sound must have reached their ears. Every time they were going about their business and doing their thing, and they had to hear that, that hammer on that nail one more time, they had to be confronted yet again with that message that they knew that Noah was speaking about repentance. And just imagine, just imagine what this must have looked like over time. This is becoming this massive, never before seen, gigantic structure in the middle of the desert. Surely it created quite a stir. People surely came from all over and brought their kids and their grandparents to come and look at this, what had to have become a tourist attraction. Because why? Because anyone who would look at it would have to ask the question, how on earth did this man do that? And you know what? They had to have looked at each other and said, it's impossible. Because it was impossible without God. But I want you to think about all of the opportunities that Noah must have had during this 120 years to speak about what the Lord had said simply because his life was preaching through long obedience. And you know what? Your life preaches too. What if your weight has to do with someone in your life who's watching? What if your long obedience is affording you the opportunity to build some spiritual stamina because of something great or some huge event that's going to take place in your life and God knows that you're going to need the faith and the character to hold up? What if your struggles, your disappointments, your disillusionments, what if your weight, you're not yet, is actually preaching a message louder than anything you could actually say? What if this is your on-ramp to your great adventure with God? What if the process is actually 
the reward. Maybe intimacy with God is best found in the times where we are forced to be on our knees in prayer. Maybe our great reward, which is intimacy with God, is found best when we're desperately looking in his word for comfort or answers because we can't find it anywhere else. And who knows? Maybe if we were to talk to Noah today and ask him his highlight of his life, maybe, just maybe, he would say, it was when I was learning to build a boat with my father. Maybe the process, the waiting, the depending on him, Maybe that is the great reward. Let us not forget that beyond any circumstance, achievement, miracle, or event, our greatest reward is to know and be loved by God. So how are we going to be like the example that Noah gave us? How are we going to keep with the faith when we're getting tired and when we're getting disillusioned and nothing looks like it's happening. Well, I'll leave you with just this one line from an old hymn that just kept playing on repeat in my mind as I was writing this sermon. Maybe it'll be familiar with you too. It says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Oh, 
Church, I hope you enjoy diving into the life of Noah and his example of how he expressed his faith through long obedience and gained that great reward, intimacy with God. Uh, to help you dive into this sermon a little bit more and explore how this might apply to you, we want to encourage you with these discussion questions right there in your house church. The first is, what was your biggest takeaway from today's message? The second question is, can you describe a time in your life when you felt the most intimate with God? And what were the surrounding circumstances during that time? And then the third question, is there an area of your life that you have been obedient but are you still waiting? Invite others to pray, if you feel comfortable, for your stamina to keep with the faith even in your waiting. Church, it was a blessing to be with you today, and we hope you have an awesome week keeping the faith.